All right, this is lesson two of the Elizabethan unit. And today's lesson is focused on the title, which is on the board now, How Structured Was Elizabethan Society and Government? So if you write that title down and write the keywords for today's lesson, which is hierarchy, patronage, privy council, yeoman, and extraordinary tax. Now, the learning outcomes for today, grade three, you'll be able to describe the Tudor hierarchy. We touched upon this last lesson, however, we didn't do it in lots of detail. Grade four will be able to describe it in lots of detail. Five and six will be able to explain how, it all, how ordered it really was and how the government supported it. And your top grade seven and above will be able to predict some of the problems and solutions for Elizabeth based on the knowledge of Elizabethan society. So make sure you pause the video, write today's date, title, keywords on your piece of paper, ready to go in your folder. Now, a little starter activity is going to be some recall based on last lesson. So I want you to pause the video and spend five to seven minutes on the following questions. So number one, Elizabeth was the daughter of blank. The main religion of Elizabeth was blank. So put either, I'll give you a clue, Catholic or Protestant. Elizabeth's sister did not treat Protestants very well. She was known as Bloody Mary because, tell me what Mary did that was seen as so serious. Wealth and me wealth, sorry, wealth was measured by the amount of what you had. The name of Elizabeth's government was known as the Blank Council. Gender was a problem for Elizabeth because three ways that Tudor England was different today is, and towns made the structure of society difficult because. So think about last lesson and think about what happened to towns over time. And if you're having any trouble with that, we'll go through this. All right, so pause the video here and we will go through the answers very shortly. Spend five minutes on this task, off you go. All right, so Elizabeth was the daughter. If you, as we go through this, can you just red pen any answers that you might not have got? Good little revision activity for anyone, regardless of the year group that is watching this. Elizabeth was the daughter of Henry VIII. The main religion of Elizabeth was Protestant. Remember what we said last lesson? She had this middle ground, which meant that she had tolerance towards Catholics. She wanted to keep people happy and didn't want the same roller coaster helter skelter issues that her family had had previously. Elizabeth's sister did not treat Protestants very well. She was known as Bloody Mary because think about what she did. She burned 300 people because of their religion. She had 300 people killed. She wasn't seen as very tolerant. If you weren't following her religion, then you weren't going to survive. Wealth was measured by the amount of land you had. Now, if you're a member of the nobility or the gentry, you had a much easier life because you were born into wealth. You might have been lucky if you were a yeoman who was a skilled individual who would have had a, part, would have had a small bit of land. However, if you were a tenant farmer or anyone lower, life would have been a daily struggle. The name of Elizabeth's government was known as the Privy Council. The Privy Council was dominated by men, which links to number six. Gender was a problem for Elizabeth because she was a woman. Men dominated society. They were seen as the gender that made the decisions. They had always been at the top of the hierarchy. So when Elizabeth came along, it was quite a struggle for men to be able to adapt to a female being a dominating monarch. Three ways Tudor England was different to today. Plenty of things that we've got. Remember, think back to last lesson, the start we did. No electricity, no tarmac roads. They didn't have any sewage systems. Religion was dominant in society. Lots of things that you can put for that one there. Now, towns made the structure of society difficult. Now, this is the, probably the trickiest one. Towns grew quite significantly during Elizabethan times. And because of that, some groups of people became richer, which which blurred the hierarchy. So you would have had some merchants who might have uh, traded things like wine, which would have made them a lot richer, which in turn could have possibly um, blurred the lines between the gentry and 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 these yeoman, uh, sorry, and these and these skilled merchants. 
So that's your starter. Make sure you've red penned it. That's an overview of last lesson. Let's get cracking with today's. What is a hierarchy? Now, this is me talking just some basic things here. Can you give any examples of hierarchies? Look at school today. There is a hierarchy set in school. You've got the head teacher, you've got deputy head, you've got assistant head teachers. Then you've got heads of faculty, heads of department, you've got your teachers, you've got uh, varying people within the school with different elements of power. Why is it like that? To keep control. Everyone has different roles to play, and as a result, the school runs smoothly. Now, we've got to understand that Elizabeth was reigning, so she was in charge at a time where there was no police force or permanent army. So having this clear hierarchy was vital. OK, however, society, government and law was also based on inequality. So there were also some issues that she had to deal with for a smoother hierarchy. So hierarchy is that ordering of power. Very important keyword because Elizabethan society was based around that concept of hierarchy. And as we see on the board, this is a simple definition, a system in which members of an organization are ranked according to their status or authority. So your first task for this lesson, we're gonna do a little bit of guided readings. This is the 4C of communication. We're gonna be looking at sort of this, the, the concept of reading, a guided piece of work, which leads to some tasks eventually being completed. And before I do that, if we just have a look at the side here and look at these visual, doc, these visual diagrams on the social hierarchy, as we mentioned last lesson, nobility and gentry, you've got your yeomen, your farmers, your landless and your vagrants. In the towns, it was a bit different. You'd have your merchants who would own a lot of property, your professionals, your business owners, your skilled craftsmen, and at the bottom of a town, your unskilled workers. Very useful diagrams to understand the hierarchy. And if you came out of this lesson knowing those two triangles, you'd be on a winner. Let's go into detail about how society worked. I'm gonna read it, and then you've got three tasks to do. Do this on paper when, you, when I tell you to pause the video. Elizabethans had a very clear idea of where everyone belonged in society. The monarch was at the top of the social scale, as the most important member of the nobility, followed by the rest of the nobility and the gentry. Your place in society tended to be how much land you had and whether you owned or rented it. Owning it was better than renting it. 90% of England's population lived and worked in the countryside. Yeomen held small amounts of land or an estate. They were essentially the lower gentry. So lower, better off people, but not as well off as the gentry. Tenant farmers rented the land, which usually was owned by yeomen or the gentry. In towns, the hierarchy was based on wealth and occupation. Wealthy merchants were at the top. So remember, we talked about those people that traded things like wine and very, very expensive um, materials like silk. They were followed by professionals, so your lawyers and your doctors. Next, you had your skilled craftsmen, like your silversmiths, your glovers, your carpenters, or your tailors who could be quite wealthy. They organized themselves into guilds, which were associations to monitor standards, working conditions, and you had to be part of a guild to practice a trade. So if I was a tailor, I couldn't be part, I couldn't be a tailor that trades unless I was part of a guild. Craftsmen were skilled people, skilled employees, also had apprentices in that, and unskilled laborers were at the bottom of society. Now, wherever you were in Elizabethan society, you owed respect and obedience to those above you and had a duty of care to those below you. So if you were, obviously, if you're the monarch, everyone has to obey you. However, you must, as the monarch, you also must have respect for the people below. If you don't have respect for the people below, it could cause problems. Landowners ran their estates according to these ideas. So really, landowners would take care of their tenants, especially during times of hardship. The structure was based on two things, obedience to the people above you and a duty of care to those below you. Households were run similar. So the husband and father were head of the household. 
his wife, children, and any servants servants were expected to be obedient to the to the man of the house. So here's your task. So highlight the following words in the text and write down the definition. You've got monarch, yeoman, hierarchy, tenant farmer, merchants, and obedience. Developing your understanding. Where did, where, what did your place in society depend on? Why was it important to have a strict hierarchy? Who benefited most from this hierarchy? Why do you think this? And out of 10, how fair do you think this structure is and why? Okay. Nice, easy task based on the guided reading. Give yourself six or seven minutes for this. Put it on paper if you haven't got the sheet in front of you. Pause the video and then we can move on. Okay. First piece of exam practice. If you're watching this because you were off or isolating, please write the question. Describe two features of the hierarchy of early Elizabeth society, Elizabethan society. This will be the first question you face in your GCSE paper when you do the Elizabethan paper. It's a four marker. You should spend about five minutes on this question. It's basically a fact. So what you're going to do, you're going to write the sentence, one feature of the hierarchy of early Elizabethan society was. Then you're going to give a specific factual detail. Okay, a historical fact. One, maybe two lines. You are then going to develop it explain it, expand it, okay? The question is about hierarchy of early Elizabethan society. So you talk about maybe certain groups, their roles, their situations, what they were doing in Elizabethan society. So pause the video here. This is your first exam practice with us this year. Okay, we are going to look at some examples. I'm gonna give you five minutes for this. Pause the video, write this question out and the answer. This should be a really good opportunity for you to see how easy it is to get the four marks in the exam. Okay. Your last task today is to understand about the monarch and parliament. Now, it might seem really weird for you lot, especially in today's society, that we've got a queen today in England and the parliament's more, more powerful. It was the other way round in Elizabethan society. We had a parliament, but the monarch was the more powerful individual, mainly because the monarch believes they had this divine right and they were chosen by God. So we're going to just look at this information and then you're going to finish these sentences in your book and we're going to move on to the final task. So the government centred around the monarch. They were central to the whole concept. During and even before Elizabeth, monarchs believed they had divine rights. They were chosen by God. So this meant they made the most important decisions with the advice of her privy council. So with the advice of her privy council, Elizabeth could declare war and make peace, call and dismiss parliament and agree to or reject any laws they vote for. So if she wanted parliament, she calls them. If she wasn't happy with them, she dismisses them. She can agree with anything they say, also reject. She can rule in some legal cases. She can grant titles, land, money, and jobs. This was known as patronage. And it was a way to keep the people below her happy. But the queen was the ultimate patron. She could give out titles, she could give out land, she could give out money and jobs to show loyalty to people. However, they all had to have obedience and respect for the queen. The most important privy councillor that we're going to look at in this is the Secretary of the State. And the most significant person who held this position was William Cecil, who had the job until 1573. You're going to learn lots about him as this course goes on. Now, yes, the monarch had lots of regular income, but there were times where more was needed, usually in a time of war. So raising extraordinary taxation could only be done with Parliament's agreement. So this was basically a way for the monarch to raise more money in a crisis situation. So acts of Parliament were very important to be presented for approval. Now, although Parliament could vote against the Queen, they rarely did. OK, that's what we need to understand. So extraordinary tax needed to be agreed by Parliament. But it was very unlikely that they would, they would vote against it, mainly because the Privy Council was made up of loyal Protestants who realised that the Queen was the ultimate power. Now, there were some areas that only the monarch could decide upon. So this was known as the royal prerogative. So only Elizabeth could decide on certain 
things. This was to stop Parliament discussing things she didn't want discussing, including foreign policy, so dealing with countries such as Spain and France, marriage, which was a real, stick, a real, a real sticking point for Elizabeth, and succession, who was going to take on her power after she died. Those were areas that Parliament could not discuss, mainly because it was that real close, close to home for Elizabeth. Really easy to ask this. Now, this is, the, this is a skill to build your communication in writing. You're going to decide two important decisions Elizabeth could make were the Secretary of State was, extraordinary tax was, and three areas that Parliament could not discuss were. This is building up your contextual knowledge, okay? Give yourself five minutes, pause the video here, and then we'll finish up with the last few tasks of the lesson. Finishing up today, let's predict. If gender and marriage were such big issues, what will happen next? And if arguments over religion were such a big issue for Elizabeth, what will happen next? Okay, that's your second lesson on Elizabeth today. Elizabethan society, if we go back to what we wanted to do at the start of the lesson, describe the Tudor hierarchy, describe it in detail, how ordered the hierarchy really was and how government supported it, then look at some of the problems and solution for Elizabeth based on the knowledge of Elizabethan society. Finish all that up on your paper and thanks very much for watching this lesson.